today we are going to talk about those trophic change which Professor. characterize the ecosystem of a constructed wetland. Professor Higgins, yesterday we stopped at the role of plants in the formation of aerobic and anaerobic processes in constructed wetlands. Thank you, Ms. Dudutel. I've become a bit absent-minded. As we know, other treatment systems, such as activated sludge, biofilters or industrial wastewater containers, do not contain plants. Only constructed wetlands have plants as a component. Let's analyze competitive advantages that constructed wetlands have compared to other treatment systems. Professor, can I tell you about it? I was reading up on that in depth yesterday. Oh, really? Yes. If I make a mistake, you'll correct me, won't you? Okay, Betsy, go ahead. To begin with, plants are photoastros. They produce oxygen during the process of photosynthesis. Ms. Doolittle, could you please clarify why we, wastewater treatment specialists, have to study aerobic and anaerobic processes? Because we, as wastewater treatment specialists, have to know everything about the microbial communities in constructed wetlands. We have to know their taxonomic composition, biomass, productivity, and trophic hierarchies within the community. Moreover, we have to distinguish between the aerobic microorganisms and anaerobic ones, which are the basic groups within this hierarchy which actually determine the treatment processes in the wetland. Within the wetland, all these groups live as neighbors in all types of biofilms that we have already discussed. Plants supply oxygen to the wetland water through the pores of the stems and roots. Besides, each plant root develops a specific rhizosphere densely inhabited by microorganisms both aerobic and anaerobic. Treatment processes are more intense within this zone. So far, so good. But is it only oxygen which microorganisms obtain from plants? Certainly not. Plants also release enzymes which accelerate the process of organic matter decomposition. Very good. But here's a question for you. If microcytes meaning in the rhizosphere, biofilms and flocculus contain both aerobic and anaerobic microorganisms, then why do we have to oxygenate the wetland? Maybe anaerobic bacteria can deal with pollutants by themselves? have a far slower metabolism than aerobes. If we can't provide the favorable conditions for aerobes, Professor, I'm afraid that anaerobes will either take way longer to purify water or even fail to treat it. Excellent, Bessie. Let's write the next topic on the board. Trophic chains. I will talk about it and you, Betsy, will check if I understand everything right. Of course. First of all, we should specify what is a trophic chain. Professor, may I answer? Yes, Betsy, go ahead. A trophic chain is a hierarchy of relationships between plants, animals, fungi and microorganisms. In a trophic chain, there is a flow of materials and energy as one organism consumes the other. One group of organisms consuming another group of organisms forms a trophic chain. However, it should be noted that organisms within a single group may also consume each other. So, there are two types of trophic chains. Let's take a grazing trophic chain in the water environment that we are studying. This chain is composed of two types of organisms, plants and animals. Using energy from the sun, plants produce and accumulate their biomass. Then, these plants are consumed by a small-sized fish which are, in turn, consumed by a larger fish. But even larger fish are consumed by the main predator fish that dominates this particular body of water. Nevertheless, this toothy heavy eater can't feel safe because, in the end, it becomes food for the most powerful predator in the ecosystem, the human. The energy used by this trophic chain is almost inexhaustible. That is, until the sun burns out. The second type of trophic chain is a detrital chain. It consists of animals, fungi and bacteria. A detrital trophic chain doesn't require sunlight because dead photoautotrophs and other living organisms accumulated solar energy while alive, thus starting another trophic chain. It means that in a detrital chain energy is accumulated by organic relations. 
That biomass is consumed and disintegrated by such animals as mollusks, rotifers, worms, and some fish species, which are called detritivores. The then, the leftovers disintegrated biomass is eaten by fungi, protozoa, and bacteria. What's interesting is, bacteria can form their specific bacterial trophic change, which decompose detritus completely. In contrast to a grazing chain, a detrital trophic chain is exhaustible, which means this chain breaks when all detritus is eaten up in a given water area. In this regard, Ms. Doolittle, I have a question for you. Which of the two trophic chains, grazing or detrital, is used first in activated sludge systems and second in constructed wetlands? Think carefully, Betsy. I have given it some thought, Professor. May I answer? Go ahead, Ms. Doolittle. You'll never stop surprising me. Thank you, Professor. Activated sludge systems don't contain follow after chores. These treatment facilities have trophic chains which build up purely on the basis of organic matter derived from outside wastewater. Thus, it's obvious that these trophic chains are detrital. In constructed wetlands, the dead organic matter comes not only from outside wastewaters, it's also produced in the wetland resulting from some dying plants, which constitute an important part of the wetland system. Here we can see the features of the trital trophic chain. However, wetland water aftertrophs constantly accumulate the biomass, which is a feature of a grazing trophic chain. In our world, we can say that both trophic chains, the trital and grazing, work simultaneously in given treatment facility. Exactly. Therefore, it should be noted that unlike activated sludge systems where all processes are controlled by humans, constructed wetlands are partly self-regulated. Thanks to the self-regulating processes and a combination of the trital and grazing trophic chains, water treatment is much more effective in constructed wetlands than in activated sludge systems. Since hydraulic retention time in the constructed wetland is several times more than that in activated sludge systems, trophic chains in the wetland have time to adapt to the changes in wastewater composition. This adaptation is promoted by biological processes related to either the grazing trophic chain or the detrital one. Could you give any other examples of such processes, Ms. Doolittle? The growth of protozoa, which consume all kinds of bacteria, including pathogenic ones. Increase in worm biomass and other organisms which disintegrate a large detritus. Improving diversity of bacteria, which decompose specific micropollutants in wastewater. Stop! Thank you. Let's first solve a problem. So. Activated sludge systems and constructed wetlands have the same amount of original bacterial biomass. The proportion of aerobic bacteria to anaerobic is also the same. The generation time of bacteria is the same in both facilities. It takes 2 hours for aerobes and 10 hours for anaerobes to double their biomass. In addition, hydraulic retention time in activated sludge systems is 12 hours and 120 hours in the constructed wetland respectively. The question is, how many generations of aerobes and anaerobes will be produced during the given hydraulic retention time in each of these treatment facilities? Oh, this is interesting. I see you're ready to answer, Ms. Doolittle. The answer to the second question. There will be six generations of aerobes and two generations of anaerobes in the activated sludge system. Approximate 60 generations of aerobes and 12 generations of anaerobes will be produced in the constructed wetlands. Thank you, Ms. Doolittle, you are correct. Let's summarize what we have discussed. The conditions of the problem you've told were ideal, which accounts for the extraordinary numbers you obtained in your calculations. However, despite the given ideal conditions, you determine the basic indicator uh, independent of these conditions. Can you guess what it is? I guess it's the ratio of produced bacterial generations over hydraulic retention time in the wetland and over hydraulic retention time in the activated sludge system. Right. And why this ratio is so important? 
because despite the provided background conditions in the wetland and in the actuated sludge system, this ratio is only correlated with the hydraulic retention time in both facilities. As a consequence, it remains constant. Which means that adaptation of bacteria in constructed wetlands is 10 times as high as the same adaptation in activated sludge system. What's the mechanism of this adaptation? Uh, as bacteria reproduce, they consume toxic organic matter which are further incorporated into a bacterial cell. Besides, the bacteria of every new generation adjust their metabolism to consume more of this toxic in them. Am I right, Professor Higgins? As always, Miss Dolittle. Therefore, the advantages of constructed wetland over the activated sludge system is obvious to us. There is nothing to do but quantify the amount of organic matter which can be processed by a wetland during hydraulic retention time. Please, write on the board, measuring organic load. As we know, organic matter content in water is characterized by two parameters. Biochemical oxygen demand, BOD, and chemical oxygen demand, COD. If BOD deals with organic matter available for bacteria, COD consists partly of BOD and partly of recalcitrant organic matter. The measurement of the organic load is the total amount of organic substrate entering the wetland over a given period of time, per hour, per day, per month, and so on. But in your opinion, why do we have to measure organic load? And what does it have to do with trophic chains that we are dealing with? If we measure organic load in the influent and the affluent of the wetland, we can determine the remaining organic matter in the wetland. That is to say, we assess water treatment effectiveness over a given period of time. Moreover, we estimate if grazing and detrital trophic chains are capable of decomposing the retained organic material in the system. And if not? Then we add animal disintegrators, protozoa and bacteria into a wetland or increase the water retention time. Exactly, Betsy. In this regard, let's solve one more problem. Can you please write it up? Given BOD of organic matter content and the constructed wetland inlet is 70 mg O2 per liter, while COD is 120 mg O per liter. The influent flow rate is 100 cubic meters per day. Outlet water flow rate, including evaporation, is 95 cubic meters per day. BOD5 and COD are 10 mg O2 per liter and 13 mg O per liter, respectively. We need to calculate, first, the BOD and COD load in the given treatment facility per day. Second, the BOD5 and COD amount of organic matter processed in the treatment facility per day. Are the conditions clear? Yes, sir. Calculating. I have the answer. I hope I haven't made any mistakes. The BOD organic load is 7 kg per day. The COD is 12 kg per day. What's more, the BOD and COD for the treated organic material in the wetland is 6.05 kg per day and 9.15 kg per day, respectively. You haven't made any mistakes, Miss Dolittle. Yet you could have rounded second decimate places. I'll take it into account. Our next topic is nitrogen compounds as pollutants. Betsy, it's way too early. What do you mean, sir? Well, first of all, it should be considered that... Betsy, please write down the next topic on the board. Nitrogen is a good guy. We will cover it later. I don't quite understand. I'm already running late for the meeting of Academic Council. You're always running late somewhere, Professor. <laughs> 